House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. You are back in the House of Mystery, and I'm Al Warren. Co-hosting today, we've got Mr. David Martino. Hello. hello. I'm back again. <laughs> we can't get rid of you. <laughs> and you can't. It's like a bacteria. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you need some uh, hand soap. Oh, there's, there isn't str- anything strong enough. No. Um, well, Absolutely not. Uh, it's been an interesting week, and we're finishing off the week with a writer today. Uh, looks like quite the mystery writer. Uh, lots of information here. So um, let's just get her on the show. So let's welcome Kathleen Casca. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Alan. Well, uh, Kathleen, so, wow, you've got quite the uh, little bit of a repertoire here. You got, So you're really into um, looks like Sherlock Holmes. I am. And, and some of the other. What, what brought you into Sherlock Holmes, do you think, or where did it start for you when you got into that type of a mystery? I've always enjoyed Sherlock Holmes from the very first time I read The Hound of the Baskervilles when I was in high school. And so I've had his collection on my shelf for years, but I never really got into the study of Holmes until the mid-90s when I started writing mystery trivia books. And one of the books I wrote was the Sherlock Holmes mystery trivia book. With Sherlock Holmes, um, what is it that makes it so special that you kind of study into and stuff? What, what, what's different about Sherlock Holmes? That's, that's a good question, and a lot of people ask that question, and it seems like everybody has a different answer. Sherlock Holmes is the perfect detective. I think a lot of people can identify him. He's a bit unusual, but yet at the same time, he's very intelligent and he's very intuitive. And it was written at the time where not many writers wrote detective stories. So it was a bit unusual back in the late 1800s. So a lot of people got into Sherlock Holmes and then he just gain popularity from there and pastiches were written and other stories were written and then it became popular in radio and television and film and it's just mushroomed and it doesn't show and there's no sign of it slowing down. I mean, the Sherlock Holmes craze is is just phenomenal. Do you, do you like all the newer renditions of Sherlock Holmes and the variations, you know, like they've done female Sherlock Holmes done, uh, you know, American ones. And, uh, and, you know, there's all sorts of uh, imagery of Sherlock Holmes. Um, do you like that when they vary I do. some of the original? I, I really do. I, I can't think of any I don't like. A couple of years ago, I had a, a publisher ask to update the Sherlock Holmes trivia book, which came out originally in 1999 and then my agent contacted me and said, I have another publisher who would like to pick it up and have you update the book. And so that was great because then I got to rewatch all 158 episodes of Elementary. And I rewatched the BBC Sherlock series, the Robert Downey Jr. films, and that, and I, I liked him the first time I watched him, but watching him again, it was even better. And I also found out about the Hulu TV series called Miss Sherlock. It was uh, filmed in Japan. So Sherlock Holmes is a woman and Dr. Watson's a woman. So I watched those and, and I really, really enjoyed them. But I think my favorite it's a toss between BBC's Sherlock Holmes and um, Elementary. I just, I really enjoy both of those series. I'm sad that they're no longer on the air. Yeah, yeah, they're both good. Um, now, what, what's your opinion on uh, the differences in 
UK mystery detectives like Sherlock Holmes, for instance, and American mystery detectives, do you find that there's a different approach or a different method to the way they write their books? I, I think a lot of the books written by British authors are, of course, uh, they're influenced by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, but also Agatha Christie. So they have this um, who done it flair that is more of a cozy, not a lot of violence, um, not a lot of uh, bad language, but the American authors are a lot, oh, I hate to say this term, maybe bolder and anything goes, but so are some of the recent British ones. I read both. I, I just enjoy mysteries. Um, I don't go in for the real violent ones, but I like hard-boiled detective mysteries, and I like cozy mysteries, and I like police procedurals, and a lot of the British mysteries are police procedurals. So they're, they're different kind, and... Um, I don't think there's a big difference in them now, but several years ago, I think a lot of the writers were picking up the Agatha Christie type of whodunit uh, writing. Now, w with all of that um, in in you, uh, you know, thinking about all these Sherlock Holmes and, and these mysteries and stuff in that history. Um, what was it that, um, you know, let's say inspired you or got you to actually decide to write your own books, your own mysteries? The more mysteries I read, the more I decided that I would like to try to do this. I would like to try a mystery because I love the way the mysteries are plotted, how everything is woven together to the conclusion at the end. But when I started writing seriously, I didn't know exactly what I wanted. I know I wanted to write mysteries, but I really didn't know how. So I decided to just write as many different things as I could. I joined the Austin Writers League when I was in Texas. I took some creative writing classes. And if something came my way, some opportunity to write something, I, I took it. Uh, I was travel writing for a while, uh, writing, freelance writing. I wrote, I wrote, uh, for a science textbook company in Austin. I wrote short stories and plays. And I was just kind of trying my hand at, at different things, kind of scared to start writing my first mystery. So what I did was at, at in the nineties, Trivia books were popular. So I thought, well, I'll just kind of see what I can do writing a trivia book. I had Agatha Christie's entire collection. I had Sherlock Holmes' entire collection. So I started a mystery trivia series. And the first one was the Agatha Christie trivia. After that, it was uh, Alfred Hitchcock trivia. And then finally, Sherlock Holmes. So that was a real education for me. And then I started writing and the first series I wanted to write a series that had a social cause theme so I started writing the Kate Carraway mystery series she's an animal rights activist I wrote a couple of books and I couldn't find a publisher I just kind of set them aside for a while and I was also at the time, really into reading Janet Ivanovich's Stephanie Plum series. I'm sure you're familiar with that. I really liked her humor. So I thought, oh, I'll see if I can do this. And so I started writing the Sydney Lockhart series. I wanted a series with a lot of quirky characters. I wanted to put a lot of humor in it. And that series took off right away. Um, and then I brought back the Kate Carraway series later. So basically, to answer your question, I try to write what I enjoy reading. Um, I just finished a hard-boiled detective mystery set 
in the 1940s in Manhattan because I liked reading the old hard-boiled detective authors like Dashiell Hammett and uh, Raymond Chandler. Now, on your Sidney Lockhart mysteries, it's set in the 1950s. What about the 1950s makes it a great time to write a mystery? When I started writing Sidney Lockhart, I wanted it, I started writing it in current times, but then I thought, I want to make this different. And I was born in the 50s. The 50s is an era that is so full of opportunities for women. It was right after World War II. Um, women are now out working. So I wanted to have a, a heroine who was a young woman who was struggling to get her career off the ground in the 1950s. And I didn't want to make it easy for her. I mean, if she won, she's, she set out to be a, a journalist. Today, if a young woman wanted to be a journalist, it would, there would be no question. Okay, okay, that's great. But in the 1950s, she was entering a man's world. So I didn't want to make it easy for her. So that's why I said it in the 50s. And it just seemed to suit my character a lot better. So that that's why I changed it. And, it, and I everything seemed to click once I switched the setting and put it in the 50s. So you like writing about the challenge of, 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 of her at the time of being a detective and stuff. So that was a big part of it. Um, Sydney, Sydney Lockhart. So who, how would you describe that character? Who is she? She's a young, independent, sassy, do-it-herself type of woman. Um, she has, is focused on her career. She doesn't want anything to get in the way of her career. However, she comes across in the very first book a man who she is attracted to. I have to step back and say that when I'm writing, I do not outline my mysteries. I just start writing and see what happens. And a lot of time my characters take over and send me in a certain direction. So I had Sydney in my mind being single throughout the entire series. But she meets a, a man in the first ser in the first book, Murder at the Arlington, and they become attracted to one another, but I wasn't going to bring him back in the second book. But he shows up. <laughs> so he shows up in the second book and then in the third book, and then their relationship starts to develop. She's still single, but there is a chemistry between them, and that's, that builds as the series goes on. Well, it sounds like... Um your characters have uh, surprised you as you've as you've written the book, but uh, have any of your characters ever really gone off the rails and and just kind of taken over the plot and uh, maybe changed the plot? Uh, all the time, <laughs> you know. Like I said, I really sometimes I have an ending in mind. Usually, I don't. Um, sometimes I have an idea who the killer is, and sometimes I don't. And sometimes I'm set on a certain person, certain suspect being being the killer, and then my characters and I, it, we just kind of have a conversation. It's like, no, no, that Kathleen, that's not going to work. Um, and so then I have to rethink things, and that's what makes writing a lot of fun. It's it's almost like reading a novel for me. I don't know what's going to happen. I just continue to write now. The difficult part <laughs> is about two-thirds of the way into the story where I have to take control <laughs> because I have to make everything fit together and I have to weave the plot to, to make it fit and then it becomes like a, a jigsaw puzzle, you know, just moving these pieces around to try and get them to fit in the right, in the right place. But then when that happens, it's a real satisfying feeling. But not knowing what's going to happen when I'm writing is what makes it a lot of fun. It's a surprise. 
It sounds like you have to to layer everything to uh, to, to to kind of uh, put that story together. I do. I really do. And. I have to go back and I have to look at what could possibly be a red herring. I have to look at what is when I am telling too much of the story because I'm really, I've got to keep two stories in mind. I've got to keep the story about what the reader knows. And then there's a story about what I know and what's really happening. And those are two stories. So I can't let the reader know too much then I have to give him just enough and so do I put this scene in chapter three or do I take it and I move it to chapter eight and so like I said it's like putting together a puzzle Um, and a lot of times the characters do dictate where these different scenes go how do you describe your characters in this, to you? And I mean that from a lot of fiction writers will, you know, give a description that they're like their family or they're like their kids or different things like that. So if someone asked you who the characters were to you, how would you describe that? My characters are like my friends. You know, picture sitting around with, you know, a bunch of women on, uh, you know, we're at a bar and we're talking and we're laughing and we're telling stories. And that's kind of how I picture communicating with my characters is I have conversations with them. And I usually do this not when I'm writing, but when I'm out exercising in the morning, I go for a run. And it's good because when I'm running, I don't have any distractions. And so my characters show up and we just start talking through it like, you know, like a bunch of girlfriends. And um, it's like, what, well, what if we do this? And, you know, I, I don't know. And then, and then I'll, I'll hear conversations in my head between them. And um, so, you know, it's, it's just like a bunch of girlfriends sitting around telling crazy stories. And that's how I look at my relationship with my characters. And then I really like it when a new character steps in. And it's like, okay, where did you come from? <laughs> uh, in the uh, third, third, fourth Sydney Lockhart series, Murder at the Driscoll, all my, all my um, books take place in different historic hotels. So there's Murder at the Arlington, the, uh, the Arlington Hotel in Hot Springs, Murder at the Luther, the Luther Hotel on the Texas coast. The fourth one is Murder at the Driscoll, which is the Driscoll Hotel in Austin, Texas, which is where I, I lived for 25 years. And when I was writing Murder at the Driscoll, this young, young girl shows up at the beginning in the very first chapter, and her name is Lydia and she's 12 years old, but she's super smart, and she's super courageous, and she is just as wacky as they get. And she, and I've had so many people who have read the later books say, are you bringing back Lydia? Are you bringing her? And it's like, well, yes, because I can hardly get rid of her. (laughs) And she, her father owns a live theater kind of a vaudeville theater in Austin, which is a takeoff of a real-life theater there in town. And she pretty much runs, runs the show. She writes the script. She directs the play. She, she, she just does everything. And I mean, this girl is 12, but she's got a mind of her own, and um, uh, often she helps Sydney with the cases. And, and Sydney's comment is always, well, you know, this, this child is smarter than me by all means. So um, I don't know where she came from, but she showed up and she's, she's not going away. <laughs> well, you know, it, it sounds like you have an inner monologue that you can hear your characters um, at, uh, you, you know, you have discussions with them and such. And I was just wondering, do you, how else do you uh, experience your characters? Do you see them? Um, do you see it like a movie still images? Is, is that how you kind of process it to, to create the, uh, the story? I I do see the story in my mind um kind of in not right not right at the beginning I mainly start off with 
incidents and conversations, and then it starts to build. And then when I go back and start editing and rearranging, then I can see more of a, a visual in my mind, like a movie. Um, but I can, I can see things real clearly, but not always from the beginning. Now, you, you mentioned about how each one of these books in this series kind of um, is it's set at a hotel. Um, so is the hotel itself written as a character as well? The hotel is, is very much the scene, uh, or, or it's the setting, and that's where the murder takes place, obviously, in a hotel. But I try to bring in as much of the hotel as possible to make the reader feel that they're there. So I visited these places. That's one of the fun things about writing the book. I go and I get to stay at these hotels for a while to get the feel for, for what they're like. And then I also interview people at the hotel, the concierge, the manager, to get an idea of what the hotel was like in the 50s. In, in picking a hotel for the series, the hotel obviously has to have been around in the 1950s, but it also has to be still in operation today. So I've had I had I've had readers say I've gone I went to these hotels and I stayed there after reading your book. And one reader said um, I picked up your book Murder at the Arlington, which which takes place in Hot Springs, Arkansas. This man lived in Hot Springs and he said I read your book in the lobby of the hotel. He said, every day after work, I would take the book and I would go into the lobby of the hotel and that's where I would read it because it felt so real. So the setting of the hotels and the feel of these hotels in the 50s is really important to the story. Well, hopefully, hopefully they give you a 10% for bringing them all the guests. <laughs> Well, they they do they do a lot of nice things for me. <laughs> well, I was going to say, yeah, it's a good thing. Um, so that that brings me to like, so when you um, are planning to write, like, so you're you've kind of got the idea and stuff, and you're going to sit down and write. Do you have to be in a certain mood, or can you just turn it on? Can you like sit down and go, well, I've got nothing between ten and two today, so I'm going to sit down and write, or is there a particular feeling that has to go on or something that makes you write? I don't have a certain writing schedule. I mean, I do in a way. Uh, I'm a morning person, so I'd like to get some fresh ideas in the morning. But I used to be a teacher, and when I was a teacher before I retired, I, I did have a, a strict schedule. But now that my time is my own, I don't pretty much say I'm going to write from two to four I write when when the feeling hits me. Same way with um, creating the the characters, I just kind of the idea just kind of pops into my head from nowhere, and then it is it's often going, it's often in running, and um, and then I just start writing. But no, I don't have a particular schedule. Um, but I, you know, I can write when I want. And because I write different things, if it's early in the day and I'm not very productive, then I can switch what I'm writing and go to something else. So I'm, I'm writing the Sydney Lockhart and the Kate Carraway series at the same time. But I'm also writing blog posts and magazine articles and just, you know, a, a lot of different things. And so I will switch from one thing to the other. And once I feel that, yeah, this is what I want to say, and I'm off and running, I'm writing. So I don't really worry about how many hours a day I put in on a certain on a certain story because, it you know, in the end, it all gets done. I've, I've never missed a deadline. So <laughs> I guess it works for me just fine. Do you feel your nonfiction work and um... – well, I should just say, do you feel your your nonfiction work and, and other writing um, kind of uh, helps you to be maybe a more efficient uh, uh, fiction writer? Absolutely. It, it really does. 
uh, when I'm writing fiction, I'm just having fun and just, you know, not really worry. I'm not worrying about time or, or much. I'm just creating the story. But writing nonfiction helps hone my skills as a writer because it's much more in my book. It's more, much more of a discipline. Um, and so writing nonfiction is a good way for me to, oh, improve my craft. Um, because I have to put a lot of research in it. Um, when I, when I'm writing nonfiction, I do work from an outline. I do have to outline what I'm writing and I, it's more of a discipline for me. So that, that's good. Like I also write book reviews. Um, not my favorite thing to do, <laughs> but it really forces me to write in a different way than I normally do. So anything that I can write that helps me improve and learn and hone my skills is good, even if it is a struggle, <laughs> because I I just have to I have to keep improving. I mean I've got fourteen books out, but I still feel that there's a lot I have to learn, and um, so it's important that I write a lot, whether it's what I had planned to write or not. It's just important that I write different things to keep fresh. Now that you've written a few books and you've kind of got some under your belt, so to speak, um, do you ever go back to the early ones and kind of think, oh, I wish I had written it this way or, or want to change things or update things? I do quite often. Um, and I don't always go back and rewrite my, uh, read my other, my older books. Every now and then I have to. But um, once the book is published, it's really kind of hard for me to go back and read it because I always think that there's something I could have changed always. So it's like, it's almost like it's never really finished. <laughs> you know, I have to, I have to put a stop to it at a certain point and turn, turn the manuscript into my publisher. But then if I picked up the book six months later and started reading, I would think, Oh, I would do this differently. But I think that's part of being, uh, a perfectionist, maybe? Yeah. Well, I think it's a natural process, too, because you, I, I think for each book you complete, you probably learn something and become a better writer without even realizing it. Well, I, I hope so. You know, I, I really do. Um, like I said, I started writing the Kate Carraway series first, and I had two books written, and I put those in the, on the back burner and started writing Sydney Lockhart. And then I decided to resurrect those and find a publisher. And so I started reading, and I, yeah, they needed work. <laughs> they, they really did. Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I also wrote the third one a few years ago, and it is being edited now by my publisher. And she's, she's really racking me over the coals on that one. It's like, Kathleen, come on, you yeah. know, show. <laughs> You know, you're doing a lot of telling and not showing. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, that one was written quite a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I really appreciate her criticism because she's right. You know, it's I've learned a lot since I finished that one. And I'm really grateful to have an editor that is really holding my feet to the fire on that. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a process, you know, and that's kind of what, how it goes, you know. Editors just want to make the book better, usually, because um, that's what they do, and uh, it's a good thing. Um, it is. Now, your Caraway, what's the basic premise of the, of the Caraway books, mystery books? Kate Caraway is an animal rights activist, and every book takes pl every book deals with a different animal rights issue. The first one Run, Dog, Run, I approach the, the animal rights uh, issue of greyhound racing. And the second one, A Two-Horse Town, deals with um, saving a herd of wild mustangs in Montana. The third one, which will be out toward the end of the year, 
Eagle Crossing deals with a woman and her animal rehabilitation center. I wanted to write a mystery with a cause, a social cause, because when I was in Austin in the 90s, I was a member of Wildlife Rescue. I was an animal rehabilitator, mainly focusing on birds. So I got really into rescuing injured and orphaned wildlife with the purpose of um, sending them back out into the wild if possible. So I wanted to build that in into a mystery. And that's where the Kate Carraway idea came from. That's interesting. Um, it's it's kind of quite a bit different than your other series. Um, it, it, so, did, so did you, when you were putting together the series and getting it out, it, the main subtext or the main point of the book is just to perhaps make people aware of, 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 of animal rights and the bad things that they go through in our world. Yes, yes, that's true. Um, when I sent the first the manuscript to my agent, he said, "You know, you need to redo this because you're editorializing too much." So I was like on my soapbox, um, and I had to pull back and write a mystery and a story and not preach to the readers about animal rights and animals and greyhounds and what they go through. So I had to pull back on that. And that was a real learning experience. It's like, okay, you know, I didn't want anyone to feel that I was preaching to them. I want them to be aware of the issue and think about it, but I didn't want to be really judgmental in my viewpoint, which, you know, it's, it's kind of makes sense because nobody le- likes to be lectured, especially if it's a, if it's a novel. Right. They're getting it for a story and entertainment right. as well. Right. And you want to exactly. be more, a little more subtle about getting right. it for But I also, I also wanted them to think about it, you know, to think about what greyhounds go through. Uh, to think about um, animals that are endangered and what could possibly happen. And with with the Mustangs in Montana, um, a lot of people will say, okay, you know, a lot of these animals, you can adopt them and you can care for them and, you know, all this stuff. But there's really a lot more to it than that. And so I, I talked about that in a two horse town. Um, the solution is not always easy. And the, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. And that's what I was showing in, in uh, a two horse town with the wild Mustangs. You couldn't just take these horses and relocate them and everything would be fine. It just doesn't work that way. There are just political issues and governmental issues involved and then a lot of people who would want to care for these animals and save them really have no idea how to do it. So I try to point that out in Two Horse Town. Wow. It's an interesting topic, you know. Uh, do you do the same sort of subtexting in your other series, um, the mystery series from the 50s? Um, is there some sort of a underlying point that you try to incorporate in the story? Well, it, this, the Kate Carraway series is set in current time. And I, I just want to bring about the awareness of whatever issue I'm writing about. But I also want to bring in memorable, charismatic, entertaining characters. Um, Sydney Lockhart is a lighthearted, humorous mystery series. Kate Carraway is serious and um, kind of suspenseful. So I I want to ramp up the, the suspense in writing the Kate Carraway mysteries. And I, I wanted, and this was new for me, so I had to read a lot of books similar to what I wanted to write in order to get the feel for this. Um, and one of the, one of the writers that I, read and I really really like her series is the Nevada Bar and a Pigeon Mysteries each one takes place in a different um, national park so it's it's the 
feeling of being, you know, outdoors and a, a sense of conservation and the fact that we are stewards of this planet and we need to take care of our resources, whether they're abused animals or lost animals or or what. I, I wanted to just put that sense of responsibility that we have in my writing. Well, when you use um, use humor in your books, um, you know, comedians are said to, you know, need comedic timing to make a joke work. I just wonder, do you, do you feel there's a time? timing or maybe a rhythm to make uh, uh, humor or jokes work in, uh, in, in the prose form in a novel? There is, um, and all I can say about that is I know, I, I know it's working when I see it on the page. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, I, when I see these characters in a dialogue and in an action and it's just rolling along and rolling along and and the snappy dialogue comes out, and the sassy tone comes out, and the arguments between the characters. And to me, you know, reading it, it's funny. <laughs> but when I have other people say, oh, my gosh, I had to put your book down because I was laughing so hard. <laughs> well, then, you know, then I know that I pulled it off. But, uh, yeah, writing humor, I, I didn't think I could do it. But like I said, I just wanted to give it a try, and it just, you know, it just came out. And um, I also write a blog post called Growing Up Catholic in a Small Texas Town. <laughs> I never thought I would write about myself and growing up and or where I was from and, and all that until I had to give a speech once about that topic. And I made it funny because it really was not funny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I had a really great childhood, but, you know, I went to a Catholic school for eight years, and I was taught by nuns, and I was in a small community, and everybody knew everybody, and I was a very shy easily intimidated child so yeah it was tough so when I started on this speech I the only way I could do it was to make it funny and it it happened it just worked and so now I, I write this um, uh, blog post and I you know it's it's a great way for me to look back at my life being raised Catholic and going through this educational system and uh, being okay with it. And, you know, the Catholic Church, I'm still Catholic, but, you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt <laughs> every now and then. I mean, you really have to. And, you know, you really have to just kind of chuckle. And I don't mean that in a sacrilegious way, but just like, okay, yeah, that's really bizarre, but, you know, that's just the way it is, and that, yeah, it's kind of funny. But uh, so... Yeah, I surprised myself. <laughs> <laughs> now you've got a new book coming out, I believe, in each series. So let's let's talk about that. When when are your new books in these series coming out? And what? Yeah. Okay, Murder at the Minger, the next Sydney Lockhart, will be released on June twenty sixth. That is now available for pre order from Amazon or my publisher, and. The Minger Hotel is in San Antonio, Texas, right across the street from the Alamo. And so that that's where this, this mystery is set. But it also, part of the story leads to New Orleans. And I, I love New Orleans, so I, I brought that into the story. So part of it's set in San Antonio and part of it in New Orleans. And the subplot of this mystery is ongoing. There's, it's never completed. The thread is continuing to run on. So at the end of Murder at the Minger, of course, the mystery is solved. But the subplot is still going and it's up in the air. So the next Sydney Lockhart, I'm going back to New Orleans. And in fact, the story is written. I'm just editing the manuscript right now. But number seven is set at the Pontchartrain Hotel in New Orleans. So the wow. 
the subplot continues. Now, each one of these books can stand alone as well. Like someone buying doesn't have to start at book one. I mean, of course you want them to, to, to get yeah. to know the characters and stuff, but if someone picked up book three, um, they're, they're going to be fine. Yes, they will. Absolutely. And I kind of test this out by sending a manuscript to someone who has not read the other books to make sure that, you know, I've, I've got all the loose ends tied up and that everything makes sense. When I'm writing, I do have to give some of the backstory, but I want to give just enough to make the current story work and also make them think, oh, I've got to go back and read those other ones. But yeah, each of them can, can stand alone. You don't have to read them in order, but uh, I, I recommend it. Right. Of course. Um, now, when you look back on, on things, if someone had never um, read any of your books or heard of you yet, which is hard to believe, but um, if, if they hadn't, what one book would you suggest they read? Gosh, that's a hard question. Of course. Um, well, gosh, let's see. I would say start with the first one, Murder at the Arlington, and also with the Kate Carraway um, because there's an underlying subplot in that series as well. Um, but then I also have another book we haven't talked about. And um, that was, I, it's a nonfiction book. It's a biography of the ornithologist who saved the whooping cranes from extinction. I'm a birder. I'm passionate about birds. And, and then here, here I am talking about saving, saving some, some, endangered species and that's what this book is about um, so I want people to also read that because it's an important story about this man who devoted his life to saving endangered birds and I donate all the royalties to the Whooping Crane Foundation because it's a passion of mine and um it's something that I truly believe in. And I I am a writer. I am not a ornithologist. I'm not a scientist. But I wanted to make a difference in in this area. I wanted to make a difference in these in this species, the whooping crane. And that's why I wrote the book. So I would like for people to read that one because it's it's not just a story about birds. It's an adventure story and what this man went through to save this endangered species. I like to describe the uh, book as Indiana Jones meets John J. Audubon. It's a fun adventure story, but there's also a lot of important con conservation information in there. Now, uh do you have a website? Do you hang out on social media? What's kind of your interaction with, with fans and readers? Yes, yes. My website is simply my name, Kathleen Koska at hotmail.com. And uh, I'm also active on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I also have a editing service that I, I do um, – editing and writing coaching for other authors and and that is also found on my website so you can contact me on my website kathleencoska.com and on facebook instagram so i'm i'm out there on all of those tiktok yet <laughs> no no i have to i have to draw the line somewhere yeah <laughs> So it's a, how was the COVID for your writing? Did you sort of find that um, it interfered with your writing and this, like the stress around the you in the world and things going on in the world that are kind of well, upsetting? Does that sort of shut down some of your writing skills? Or? Well, uh, not my writing, but before COVID, I was the marketing director for a small publishing company in town. Uh, we publish nonfiction books, and I love the job. <laughs> I really, really did. But the owner of the company was elderly. She was in her 80s. And so when COVID hit, we had to just, we were planning on 
closing the company eventually anyway. But because of concern for her and her age, we just had to shut the, shut the company down real quickly. So I miss that. I really do. But it allowed me to spend more time on my writing. Um, and I started a new mystery right after COVID, right after the big shutdown. And I finished it in three months. I've never finished a, a book that quickly. But it told me that if I have to do it, I can do it. And that was a lot of fun. So I've been doing more writing since since I haven't been working part time. And that's been good. Um, so but, you know, like I, did, like I said, I, I do miss the job because it, it was a great, great place to work. Yeah. Yeah. It always it's always an interesting area to work in. Um, so. What what do you find for inspirations to write? Do you um, have other writers you like? Do you like uh, music, movies? What, what what kind of things do you like to do? I have a lot of authors who write series that I always read their books. And then I lately I've been into reading thrillers. I wasn't much into them, but I, I'm reading a lot of thrillers now. Um as, yeah, as far as inspiration, other writers, other reading is, is my biggest inspiration. Um, it kind of gets me out of a, a sticky situation if I'm, if I just don't know where to go with the next scene or I'm having trouble with a beginning or I'm having trouble with an ending, then I'll pull out some of my favorite books and I will read those and that helps me get back on track. Do you, do, what, what would be your advice for someone that's uh, a new writer that hasn't published anything, but is interested in, in writing a book and, and getting it published? What would you say they should do? Take, uh, take writing classes. Definitely take creative writing classes. Try and find a writer's critique group. That was very valuable for me when I started writing. I would meet with, I had several critique groups. I would meet with them once a week or once every other week, and I would bring a chapter or an essay to be critiqued. That helped. I also suggest joining a writer's league in your area. So I I'm still a member of it's what was the Austin Writers League is now the Writers League of Texas. I'm a member of a Writers League in the area, and I try to spend a lot of time with with other authors. Um, going to writers conferences helps. Um, just think like a writer and write. And in my in my coaching business, I coach a lot of people who want to write but they don't know how to begin and my advice is really simple the number one step is 15 minutes a day just write 15 minutes a day doesn't matter if it's good doesn't matter if it makes sense but pick a topic and write on it 15 minutes a day and I remind them I said 15 minutes is about you could probably get a page done in 15 minutes. And then if you get a page done a day, that's 365 pages by the end of the year. And even though it might not be good, at least you have something that can be, that you can work on. Because if you haven't written anything, there's nothing to work on. So that would be my advice to new writers is just to write and to learn about writing and to get out there and meet with other authors. Well, wow, that's uh, great advice. And uh, now we will have your uh, books and website up on ours as well so people can find you that are listening with one click and really appreciate you being on the show. Now, um, we've been talking with the author, Kathleen Koska. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Kathleen. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, 
or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.